We are very grateful to see some visitors in our midst, and we appreciate you coming and invite you to come back and be with us again. If you have your Bibles with you, you might turn over to 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Before we get into our lesson, I did want to mention uh, another individual, uh, Brother Ken Chumley. Uh, he spoke on our lectureship this past year and is scheduled to speak on the lectureship this, this year as well. But uh, they found a mass on his kidney, and he is supposed to have surgery to remove the kidney this week. I believe it's Tuesday of this week. So be remembering him in your prayers as well. <clears throat> I will add that they think that it's confined to that kidney and so that they will be able to get everything. But I know that he would appreciate your prayers. Paul wrote, To study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. From this verse, we can thus see that an individual can be approved of God. And he can know whether he is or not. It is through a study of the Scriptures. Those Scriptures that are inspired by God, they're profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 2, and verse 16 and 17. And... Thus, through a study of those scriptures, we can come <coughs> to a knowledge to know whether or not we are approved of God. While the religious world around us tells us, well, we can't really know anything, and they want to put everything in the realm of possibilities and maybes, and don't be definitive as to anything in regards to knowledge, Yet the scriptures very clearly indicate that we can know. That we can know that we are of God. That we dwell in Him. For example, in 1 John 4 and verse 13. We can know whether or not we have eternal life. 1 John 5 and verse 13. We can know that we are of God in the whole world. Life and wickedness. Chapter 5 and verse 19. We can know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved, we have a building of God, and a house not made with hand, that's eternal in the heavens, St. Corinthians 5 and verse 1. So we begin looking at, how can I know, how can you know, whether or not I am approved of God? And in that, there's but two proper relationships, either you're approved of God or you're not. There's the way that leads into life. Few that be that find it, Jesus says. Well, the way that leads to destruction is a broad uh, way. And a wide gate. And there's many that are going in there at Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Or as we read just a moment ago in 1 John 5, and verse 19, that we are of God in the whole world, life and wickedness. There's the two ways, and only two ways. But which way is that way that is approved of God? It is that relationship where one is in Christ. As Paul would write in St. Corinthians 5, and verse 17, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That man has, or that one has no condemnation in Christ Jesus. To walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, Romans 8 and verse 1. And so that approved relationship is that relationship where one is in Christ Jesus. And it's there where we find all spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Whereas we read just a moment ago, we have no condemnation, where we are a new creature, where we are children of God, Galatians 3 and verse 26 where we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1, 7, and Colossians 1 and verse 14, where we have salvation, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10. 
and where we will be blessed when we die, Roman, uh, Revelation 14 and verse 13. Truly, all spiritual blessings are in that approved relationship of being in Christ. And the only way to get into Christ is through that act of baptism, Romans 6, verse 3 and verse 4, and Galatians 3 and verse 27. And baptism has to be based upon genuine faith, faith that Jesus is God's Son, that He died for our sins. It must be based upon our repentance from sin, turning away from those sins to turn and to live for God. And then a confession of our faith that, I, that we do believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then being immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. That is how we enter into that approved relationship. But then also, what we want to look at this morning is a proper character. We have to have a proper character in order to be approved of God. And we want to look at this from three different standpoints this morning. First, there is the character of purity. We are to be a, have a pure life, a clean life, purity of heart, purity of actions. In Titus, the second chapter, in verse 11, Paul tells us that the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. And in verse 12, he tells us, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, God in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who died for us, or who gave himself for us. We are to deny certain things within our life. He calls it denying ungodliness and worldly lust. He's getting at the aspect we are to live a pure, a clean life. That that ungodliness, that worldly lust, will corrupt and will uh, defile that purity that we are to live. In James, the first chapter, verse 27, James will tell us that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Here's pure religion. Here's what it's all about. Here's how we are to be undefiled before God. And he sets forth two ideas for our consideration. The visit, the fatherless and widows and their affliction. The idea of visit there is not simply going by and saying, Hi, how are you doing? But it is attending to those individuals' needs. They're going to have certain needs that are necessary that they have within their life because of the condition, the situation that they find themselves in. We attend to those needs that they have. That's the idea of visiting the fatherless and widows in their affliction. But then he says, the second thing is to keep himself unspotted from the world. That the world is living in a search in such a way in such a manner that is no longer pure, and so it will defile us, and we are to live separate and apart from that. We are to be undefiled from the way in which the world lives. If we look in our society today, we start seeing very quickly the wickedness, the evil, the taint of sin within our society, within the world. There's the evil language. There's the evil actions that we see. The world sees nothing wrong in uh, fornication and adultery, homosexuality. The world sees nothing wrong with lying, with deception. The world sees nothing wrong with using language that is uh, well, it's gutter language. It's language that is crude that is taking the Lord's name in vain. The world sees nothing wrong with those type of actions. And we could list, no doubt, many others today, drinking alcohol, using drugs, illegal drugs, and on and on we could go. The world sees nothing wrong with many of those things. That's the taint of the world. And we are to keep ourselves unspotted from those things. We are not to allow those things to come into our life. We are to remain separate from those things. 
of pure in your life. That's why James would write in James chapter 4 and verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulterers, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. If you try and hold on to the world and the things of the world, the defilements of this world, you're not going to be with God. In order to be with God, you've got to be undefiled from the world and the sin, the wickedness that is found therein. What is that? That's a purity of heart. That's a character of purity that's not going to be defiled by those things because we're not their friend. What the two aspects of godliness and the world, they're at odds with one another and cannot be harmonized. And so which side are we going to be on? Are we going to be on that side of purity and righteousness? Or are we going to be on the side of the world? In 1 Peter, the second chapter, in verse 11, Peter would say, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. What is it? Here's that battle that's going on. Here's that war between righteousness and godliness and the world. The fleshly lust. You abstain from those fleshly lusts because they're at odds. They're at war with that which is of holy nature. That which is of purity. That which is of God. John would write in 1 John 2, starting in verse 15 and going through verse 17, to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for all that is in, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is of the world, and it is not of the Father. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Don't love the world. Don't have your affections on the things of this world. As Paul would write in Colossians 3 and verse 1, Set your affections on things above where Christ sitteth, not on things of this world. We're not to have our affections, our love directed at this world and the things of this world. And he describes it as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And all sin, all evil falls under those three categories. All temptation falls under those three categories. And if you have a desire, if your desire, if your love goes toward those things, that's where your life's going to go. That's where you're going to end up being. And so you don't love those things because those things are at odds with God. You cannot love God and love the world at the same time. Now then, of course, a purity of life, living a good moral life is of no value spiritually unless you're in a proper relationship with God. Cornelius was a good man, yet that goodness was not going to be able to save him. He needed to hear words whereby he and his house would be saved in Acts 10th chapter. Yet he was a good man. He lived a life of purity. But it would have had absolutely no value to him if he did not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. There has to be that proper relationship with God. And when we have that proper relationship with God, we then have to have that character of purity. We have to live that good moral life. We have to be upstanding citizens from that standpoint. Though our citizenship is not of this world, our citizenship is in heaven. Paul would write in Philippians 1st chapter and the 3rd chapter. That's why Peter says that we read a moment ago, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. What is it? We're going through this world, but this world's not our home. Our home is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. And that's the type of lifestyle that we thus live while we are here on this life, on this world. But then, second, not only is there the need for a, a character of purity, there is the need for a serving 
character. In Revelation 22 and verse 3, it says that there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. There is a serving type of character if we want to be on God's side. That we're going to be serving God. And in serving God, we're going to be serving others as well. Christ, in, as He came to this world as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, He was God manifested in the flesh. Totally God. You would think as a king he would come to be ministered into. To set it down and allow others to do everything for him. But that's not the way in which our Lord came. Our Lord came with the attitude, I'm going to serve others. And so the Lord came not to be ministered into, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for all. Is what he would say of his own life. A serving, a ministering characteristic. Paul and, or Peter in describing his life to Cornelius in Acts 10th chapter says that he went about doing good. Healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. His life, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see Jesus going about to all of these cities that lay in the area. And he did good to the people. He served the people. And Jesus gives us a scene of the judgment in Matthew, the 25th chapter. Starting in verse 31, it says that the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him. Then shall He sit on the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered together, gathered all nations. And He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand, and the goats on His left. Then shall the king say to them on the right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom for, uh, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In other words, you individuals who are sheep, who are on the right hand, who are going into heaven, you enter heaven. Now then, why? Verse 35 and following. For I was a hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. As we read those reasons that Christ gives for it, you individuals are going into heaven's home. We could sum it up in the idea of these are individuals who served others. They said, Well, when saw we thee a hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink, or when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee, or when, we, when uh, saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. He says you've served other people and that's why you're going to receive heaven's home. Because you were a serving type of had that serving type of attitude. On the other hand, those on the left hand, he tells them, Depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was a stranger and you took me not in. I, I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Again, we could summarize the idea. You did not serve me, and that's why you're going into hellfire. And they will say, Well, Lord, when saw we the, this way? And his answer again, Inasmuch as you did it not unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it not unto me. You failed to serve other individuals, and thus you're going to spend eternity in hell. Now then, do we start getting the idea that serving and having that type of an attitude, a character, is going to be important for us? 
Because it's going to determine where we spend our eternity, whether it's in heaven or whether it's in hell. It's important that we have that serving type of relationship. That we're going to be doing things for other individuals. We're going to be helping them out. We're going to be aiding them. Some individuals, it's all me, me, me. What can you do for me? So many times an individual moves into an area. They start visiting a congregation. Well, what can you offer me? What can you do for me? What are you going to do for my family? Why doesn't the church have the right to say, what are you going to do for us? What type of character are you going to have? Are you going to have a serving type of character? Or do you want to be served? Do you want us to minister to you? Or do you want to minister to you? Now the Christian attitude, the attitude that God wants us to have is, I'm going to be there to minister to others. I'm going to be there to serve others. I want to be involved and I want to do as much as I can. What happens? I've seen it over and over again through the years. You start making a few demands on someone. Try to get them involved in something. Try and get them to act upon certain things and serve others. Well, I've got to leave and go someplace else. So they don't say that, but they, that's what they do. Because they don't want to serve. They're too busy for that. They're too busy doing their own thing. Living their own life and making their own living. And it's all about me, me, me in this world instead of the service to other individuals. We need to learn to serve God and to serve others. But again, in that attitude of service, in that serving character, there has to be the proper relationship that we have. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, verse 21 through verse 23, Jesus says that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me at that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? You could stop there for a second and say, they were saying, well, Lord, we were serving individuals. We did all these things for these people. We cast out demons. We've done many wonderful works. And yet, it says, Then why profess unto them, I never knew you depart from ye that work iniquity. They had a serving attitude, but they were not in that proper relationship with God. The proper relationship with God has to be there in order for our service to be of any value for us. But when we have that proper relationship with God, we can be assured as Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That labor that is in the Lord, that is in Christ, that service, that labor, that work that we are involved in, that's going to be about you. It's not in vain. It's not worthless. It is not valueless. It has value. It is necessary for our salvation. So many want to, I've become a Christian. Now that I can just show up every once in a while with services and I'll expect to go to heaven. No, they have the, proper, the improper attitude. And they need to change the attitude. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to be out doing what God wants me to do. I'm going to be out teaching others about Jesus Christ and His saving grace. I'm going to be teaching others about the one church, that church of Christ. I'm going to be teaching others about how to appropriate to themselves that salvation. I'm going to be teaching others how to worship God, how to live the Christian life. I'm going to be out ser serving others. I'm going to be out doing good works to them. I'm going to be out helping them and aiding them in those areas of which they have need. 
a serving character. And then God says, yes, that is of great value. But then a third area. Not only do we have need of having a purity of character, a serving character, but we also need a worshiping character. God, when He created man, placed within man certain needs. We generally immediately recognize the need of air, for example. You go without air for just a few minutes, you die. The need for water and food. Water, you can survive a few days. Food, a few, maybe a month without food. But we need those things in order to live. There's other needs, though, that God has placed within us. There's the need for love, for example. You have a baby and you leave it just to itself and don't, don't give that baby any love and generally that baby is going to die. And so they found that they need to even those in orphanages where the care might not even be what might be in the United States in a good type of a situation in the United States, even though not the best, certainly. But they needed to be picked up. They needed to be held and loved and cuddled a little bit. Why? Because there's that need within man for love. There's also the need that God placed within man to worship. And if you look within any society that's ever been upon the face of this earth, you will find that it is a worshiping people. Now then, the worship might be directed in an improper way. It might be a worship of self. It might be a worship of animals. It might be a worship of statutes, statues or idols. It might be directed in, the, in an improper way, but it's there because there's that need that God placed within us to worship. Now then, our worship has to be directed in the proper way in order for it to be effective. And that is, we've got to worship our God, the Creator of this world. And yes, that is, includes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They all are God. But our God is one who is worthy of worship as well. Idols, what are they? They're the works of man's hands. They're not worthy to be worshipped. Man himself, why should we worship man? They're not worthy to be worshipped. God is one. God is the creator of this world. He created us. And as creator, He has the right to be worshipped by His creation. Man. And so we direct our worship to God. That worship then must be directed, not only directed to Him, it must be done as He sets forth. Very first time really we observe man worshiping God. We see that worship can be either approved or disapproved by God. Cain and Abel. Abel offered unto God an acceptable sacrifice. Cain's sacrifice, though, was not acceptable to God. And so simply because we worship God does not mean that we worship acceptably. It has to be done according to God's will. Abel, by faith, offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Faith comes right here in God's Word. God had instructed man as to worship Abel followed those directions. Cain did not. And as a result, Abel's sacrifice was acceptable. Cain's was not acceptable to God. So we are to worship according to God's will today. God has set forth that, that upon the first day of the week we gather together to worship Him. And in that worship... We sing praises to God. 
as we have done this morning, and that means singing without an instrument of music, because God never authorized in New Testament worship an instrument of music, and thus to add something like unto that is sin and will cause us to be lost. We sing praises to God. Then we pray to the Father through the mediatorship of Jesus Christ. And those prayers, of course, have to be according to God's will. We then not only sing and pray, but we partake of the Lord's Supper, the bread and the fruit of the vine, in memory of the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross. How that Jesus shed His blood there so that we can have the forgiveness of our sins. We then give of our means, contribute into that common treasury, the church's treasury for the work of the church, so that the church can meet the needs that arise in those areas that it has, and that it needs to take care of. And yes, in that pre uh, there is that preaching, that teaching of God's Word that is to be done in that worship that man directs toward God. Now, in some of those things, yes, we can do it any times. Singing, prayer, the teaching of God's Word. But the only day that is authorized for the partaking of the Lord's Supper is Sunday, the first day of the week, Acts 20 and verse 7. And in regards to that giving into that common treasury, Paul would teach us in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, that that is to be done on Sunday, the first day of the week again. And so, on that first day of the week, we come together and worship to God. That's not the only time that we worship God, though. We come together on Sunday night as well to worship, to worship God again. We come together on <coughs> Wednesday night. Why? To study God's Word, to learn its truths. And in that we sing those praises to God and worship to Him. We pray to God and worship to Him. We study His Word and worship to God. God is to be worshipped in the here and now according to His will. It also has to be done with the proper attitude of heart in spirit. John 4, verse 23 and verse 24 sets forth these three principles. That our worship is to be directed to the Father. It's to be done in spirit and in truth. Spirit is our proper is the attitude that we have as we worship. And as we sing those songs of praise to God, we're thinking about the words. As we pray to the Father, again, we're thinking about what is being said, what is being prayed. We're making that prayer our prayer our petition to God as we partake of that bread and fruit of the vine that we are thinking about our minds are going back to that sacrifice that Christ made upon the cross as we give of our means putting money into that collection that common treasury we're doing such with an attitude of cheerfulness now I'm going to be helping I'm going to be aiding the Lord's cause as I study God's Word, I get God's Word and I study, I learn the truths that are found in it as directed by that one who is doing the preaching. Our attitude must be right, it must be proper in order for us to worship God acceptably. If God has set forth within us that need to worship and we have that need, we need to make sure that it is done right. But it's interesting that God not only is to be worshipped in the here and now, God is going to be worshipped throughout all eternity. And if we have a worshipping character in the here and now, when we get to heaven, we want to have that opportunity to worship, to fulfill that desire that we have, that character that we have now, we're going to be able to fill it, fulfill that throughout all eternity. But what about that individual who doesn't really have that worshiping type character now? Number one, he's not going to get to heaven. Number two, if he even made it to heaven, he wouldn't enjoy it. It'd be miserable for that individual. 
to have to go through an eternity of worshiping God when he doesn't even enjoy it now? He's not going to enjoy heaven. He's not going to make it in the first place because he doesn't have the proper character. Now, who has that type of character? The individual who's here on Sunday morning but doesn't see any need to come back on Sunday night or Wednesday night have that worshiping type of character? No. He might have that character where I want to get there on Sunday morning and have my ticket punched to heaven. But he doesn't have the type of character that's a worshiping type of character. If he is, if he had that type of character, he'd be here on Sunday night and Wednesday night. He'd take advantage of all of the opportunities that were given to him to come together and worship God with people of like precious faith. Now then again, a worshiping type of character will do us no good unless we have the proper relationship with God. We see that with the Athenians in Acts 17th chapter. They were very religious. And Paul, as he would pass by, he beheld all of their devotions to their gods. But they didn't have the proper relationship with God. And that worship was thus ignorant worship. We need the proper relationship with God. That proper relationship with God is found when we are baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins based upon our faith, repentance, and, and confession of our faith as we enumerated earlier. And then we live the type of life of denying ungodliness and worldly lust. That we live separate and apart from sin. We abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. We don't try to be the friend of the world, but instead the friend of God. We don't love the world. We don't set our affections on the world. We set our affections and our love on God. Having that type of a purity of character. And then a serving character where we will serve God and we will serve others doing good, doing that which is needful within their life to help them and to aid them. And then a worshiping type of character where we have that desire to be at worship each and every time so that we can worship that one who is our creator and our sustainer of life. And the giver of that which will be spiritual life throughout all eternity if we will remain faithful to Him. Now, if that's not the type of life that you're living, or if you've never entered into that relationship with God, that proper relationship with God, then why not this morning? Avail yourself of the opportunity that God is giving unto you to become a Christian. Do those things that we enumerate. If you've become a Christian, but you haven't lived the type of life, that purity of life, that serving life, that worshiping life, then why not come back into Him this morning? Make things right with Him. Change your life. Turn it around to where you will have the type of character that will be acceptable to God when we stand before Him in judgment. So we can hear those good words, enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. You need to come this morning.